fühle mich sehr geehrt, den zweiten internationalen Gast heute Ihnen allen vorstellen zu dürfen. Tim Cole ist gekommen direkt aus Bristol. Obwohl der Flug versch verschoben wurde, hat er es noch hergeschafft. Ich bin wirklich, wirklich froh. Ähm, warum habe ich ihn eingeladen? Äh, Tim Cole ist Historiker, hat sich viel beschäftigt mit sozialer... Ich habe ich habe es übersetzt soziale und den Auswirkungen von Holocaust auf das soziale und aber auch auf landwirtschaftliche und Umweltaspekte. Wie wie zeigt es sich bis heute in unsere in unsere Landschaft, in unsere Erlebnislandschaft sowohl der Landschaft im Kopf als auch der Landschaft in der Realität und auch mit auf Deutsch heißt es digitale Geisteswissenschaften. Dafür ist er Spezialist und warum er hier ist, das wird er dann gleich selber erzählen, weil er der Historiker war, der die Gruppe um den Umgang mit der Colston Statue in Bristol begleitet hat oder auch entwickelt hat. Danke, dass du heute da bist und uns dieses Best-Practice-Modell vorstellst. Ich freue mich sehr und ich bin schon sehr gespannt. Ich muss es jetzt da irgendwie rein. Um, thank you so much, um, and apologies for speaking in English rather than German. I can understand that my speaking is not so good as it is in Hungarian, so we'll go for English. Um, and I hope this might be of, of use in the context of the Loega statue, that I think the, the, the thing that we've been doing in Bristol um, has a lot of parallels, I think, with the potential in, in Vienna um, for thinking about the kinds of democratic processes that might be useful. So in, in the days after the Colson statue was toppled in um, June 2020, the mayor of the city um, asked me to chair a commission of historians. Um, and our brief was really to um, explore aspects of the city's history with citizens in the city. But we also wanted to begin with the fallen statue um, and think about the bigger question of who's remembered on the streets of the city. Just a little bit of history. The statue itself was unveiled in November 1895, right in the heart of Bristol. It appeared um, long after Colston's death, during a period when his memory was revived for a number of reasons. In part, Colston was a hero for one group of the city's elite, merchants, Anglicans, Tories, those living north of the river. And they were engaged in the late 19th century in statue wars with a newer elite, manufacturers, religious nonconformists, liberals, based south of the river. But Colston was also someone who they both found common cause with, praising his philanthropy in the wake of the rise of socialism and trade union activity in the city. I think it's very much about trickle-down economics, that Colston represents trickle-down economics in the late 19th century. But in the late 20th and early 21st century, the presence of the statue came under increasing criticism, given Colston's role within the transatlantic slave trade. And this led to a whole series of artistic interventions. Um, here is a photographic work by Hugh Long, Hugh Locke, sorry, called Restoration from 2006. Um, and here's a more direct intervention onto the plinth by a graffiti artist, Will Coles, from 2017, where he calls out who Colston was. So the silence on the statue is similar to the Loega statue, um, that there's something missing, there's a text missing. And so a series of artists, if you like, start to add this text to the statue. Um, Faith M adds uh, knitted shackles in um, 2018. Really interesting intervention in 2018 as well, here and now, where the installation of uh, the outline of a slave ship um, is placed around the statue. So these series of interventions, I think, become more explicit about Colston's role within transatlantic slavery. And then obviously in 2020, the statue becomes um, the focus of attention during the Black Lives Matters protests in the city. Initially, um, just placards were attached at the beginning of the protests, but then at the end of the protests, um, the statue itself was pulled down um, and taken to the harbour, pushed to the harbour, where it was dumped into the water. Here it is being pulled out of the harbour the next day um, by the city council. So the city council remove it from the, the harbour and they put it in the city museum for storage. 
And this is where we became involved. The newly established History Commission um, worked with the curators from the City Museum to co-create a temporary exhibition of the statue. Um, and we opened it one year after the statue was pulled down, mainly because then COVID um, allowed for the museum to reopen. The COVID wave was a little bit over, and so we could reopen the, the museum. But we saw this very much as an opportunity for citizens in the city to see the statue, to learn about its history, to learn about Colston and his role in transatlantic slavery, but also to be involved in the discussion about what to do next. And so we chose intentionally as a title for the exhibition, a question. In a sense, the exhibition was posing a question to the city, the Colston statue, what next? And, and we chose a very intentional image, um, an image of the statue halfway down. So in a sense, we were inviting visitors to decide if they leave it halfway or they topple it or they put it back. So we wanted this to be very much a conversation with the city and a, a dialogue. So the exhibition was intended to contextualize the statue in Colston, but also to invite people into um, a dialogue. And to do that, we opened um, an online um, consultation, an online survey, um, the results of which visitors could see live in the exhibition. So the exhibition created the, the responses and the responses were visible in the exhibition. We ran the survey for four to five months and we had about 14,000 people contribute their responses. It's the biggest survey ever undertaken in Bristol. 14,000, 14,000. Um, more than half came from Bristol, from the city itself, but we also had a big response nationally and internationally, either visitors that came to the museum or who saw the online exhibition. So we created an online twin for the, the physical exhibition. One thing that really struck me was how much interest there was in the city from very different social groups. So this, we took some demographic data, um, and this is um, showing um, from the poorest parts of the city to the richest parts of the city. Um, so the city divided into those, court, uh, those percentages, deciles. And what you see is um, an incredibly even response um, that the poorest parts of the city wanted to say what should happen to the statue and the richest parts of the city wanted to say what happened to the statue. Here we work quite hard, shifting from online to paper because of the digital divide. So for example, we could track which parts of the city weren't responding to the online survey, and then we could go and put paper questionnaires through the letterboxes of those homes so that everyone could have their say. It felt really important um, that the, the poorest to the richest were equally represented, their voice was equally represented. One thing that really struck us was the engagement of young people in this. Um, so here you start with the youngest children at the top. We didn't get many um, eight and nine-year-olds engaged, but we got a lot of um, 18 to 34-year-olds, so an incredible engagement from young people. And it, it surprised me in many ways how much young people cared about this. Um, there was a, um, a journalist from the Atlantic Monthly who visited the exhibition and she's a journalist who goes to museums. Um, so she's um, someone who, that's her, she's a museum critic. And the thing she said to me was she'd never seen so many young people in a museum as she did for this temporary exhibition um, from all of the museums she's ever, ever gone to, that I felt like there was a real appetite amongst young people in the city. We had less response from high school children, so um, students at the high school. And so what we did was we organized focus groups within high schools um, to have discussions with high school students about their attitudes to this question. Just in terms of the ethnic breakdown of the city, this is um, the ethnic breakdown of the city. So the middle line is, is the number of um, people from different ethnic groups within Bristol. Um, and then, um, sorry, the bottom line. And then the, the middle line is how many responded. So we had fairly good representation from all of the ethnic groups, a little bit less from black British um, and Asian British. We can maybe discuss that later. What we wanted to do is we wanted the city to, um, to engage with three questions. So the first question was, what do we do next with the statue? Is a museum the right place for it? So we were displaying it temporarily at a museum, almost as a prompt, 
and we felt like we wanted to see, well, do you think a museum is the right place? If you see it now in a museum, does it feel right? Does it look right? Is that where this statue should be? And we found that most people in the city um, said yes. So at the top, you've got all respondents um, to the survey, so all 14,000. And the second line is um, the 7,000 from the city. So 80% of the city um, said that they did want um, the statue in the museum. About 12% wanted it back on the plinth, and about 4% wanted it destroyed entirely. So they felt that it was so problematic that it shouldn't be in a museum, but it should be destroyed. What I think was interesting um, to me um, was that in the aftermath of the toppling of the statue, there was a lot of media speculation and also, I think also political suggestions that the city and the nation was divided 50-50 over what to do next. Um, and certainly those were the conversations that I think were often happening within the city, an assumption that the city was terribly divided. But actually what I, I was struck by was that actually when we asked the city, most people said, yeah, a museum makes sense. And in particular, they talked about the fact that this was such a complex and contentious object that it needed much more contextualization than simply the addition of a new plaque or a small text, that it needed the space of a museum display to really allow all of the complexity of the object to be discussed. And this was something interestingly shared by both the richest and poorest parts of the city. So again, this is from the poorest parts of the city at the top to the richest parts of the city at the bottom, that you get an incredibly even response from every part of the city. Every social um, demographic felt that a museum was the right place for an object as complex as that. But it, there was also something else, and I think this is something that Tanya referred to, um, that there was also a sense that a museum was the right place for it because this statue needed to be put down to size, so not looked up at in the street, but actually laid on its back. One of the things we asked people to tell us was we said, if you want it in a museum, how should it be displayed? Um, and um, for every six people who answered that question, five said it should definitely be displayed lying on its back with the graffiti and paint still on it because this isn't someone who should be looked up to on the city street, but someone who should be looked down on or engaged with in a very different manner. Um, I thought it was interesting, um, that idea that actually maybe, and back to Tanya's point, maybe all statues need a, a shelf life, that after 100 years, a statue moves from the streets to the city um, uh, because uh, new people are seen to be significant, new values emerge within a city or a society. And so one thing that, this conversation developed, I think, was a much bigger critique of statues on the, on the streets of the city. So, for example, like here in, in, in Bristol, we have one woman um, in a statue form, Queen Victoria, um, so hardly representative. And I think those questions became important to people, like who's represented. People suddenly started to look more critically in the public space um, of the city. So one of the things that we did um, is to recommend that the statue um, enters into permanent display in the museum in a particular way, contextualizing it and displaying it horizontally. And at the moment, this is what we're doing. We're working with the museum to develop this new display um, of the statue. We also asked what should be happening with the empty plinth. So the statue was pulled down, but the plinth remained. Um, and this is interesting, I think, because it was a much more mixed reaction. So you can see um, that there was the most um, enthusiasm for temporary artworks or sculptures. So a little bit like the fourth plinth Trafalgar Square, um, but a more mixed reaction. Um, I think one thing that came through was people wanted sometimes something there, but also times of emptiness, that the emptiness, people said, felt very symbolic. Someone wrote about the absence of a white man being a really important presence in the city, that that felt like a really important um, thing. And so this is one of the things that we're discussing um, at the moment is um, how we might um, develop this. But most wanted to see um, some kind of plaque attached to the plinth. And so um, this is the plaque, um, the wording of the plaque um, that we um, hope will be um, attached to the plinth very shortly um, to explain a little bit about just um, the fact that there was a statue here um, and uh, that the statue was taken down and where it now is. Um, so to record both the events 
of November 1895 when the statue was put up, but also critically the events of June 2020. So if you like, the life history of a statue feels important to Mark um, in the city. This, this was an interesting thing, I think, that we wanted not just to think about what people thought, but also what people felt. So in the conversation with the city, we, we recognize that this was a question of emotions. So this wasn't just a cerebral discussion about a statue, but it was also like a kind of heartfelt, emotional discussion. Like people cared about this and cared strongly. And so we wanted to take the emotional temperature of the city one year later. Um, so we asked people explicitly to talk about their feelings and what their feelings were towards the statue and the statue being removed. And, and this is the response um, from the city. You can see the second one, um, that 65% of the city felt positive about the fact that the statue had been removed. Um, so the majority of the city um, felt positive. But you can see much more divided responses if you look elsewhere. Um, so if you look at um, the national um, story, um, in part I think this was because of um, a, a lobby group, Stave Our Statues, that took over, that really popularized this. And so I think we get a lot of voices from them. One thing that's interesting, again, this is from richest to poorest, is what you see is that, interestingly, actually, the richest um, part of the city at the bottom and the poorest part of the city at the top, so decile one and decile 10, more or less felt identically about the statue being removed. Um, so this was something that really united both rich and poor in the city, um, that people had very similar um, sentiments and emotions about the statue being removed. But the, the big difference came with age. So this is all 14,000 respondents. So you can see the kids at the top, 0 to 17, high school kids, overwhelmingly positive. Down at the bottom, 75 plus, overwhelmingly negative. So this is all 14,000 respondents. And then this is the Bristol respondents, almost exactly the same mirroring. And, and this was really interesting for us. We, we didn't expect this going into the conversation. Um, I mean, in a sense, going into the conversation, we didn't expect anything. We didn't know what people were going to say. We were surprised how, how so many people said the statue should be in a museum. Um, we were surprised how positive people were about the statue coming down. We felt that maybe there would be more difference around social class, that there might be more of a divide between the, the richest and poorest parts of the city. We didn't really expect, in a sense, this graph to come out that's almost like the perfect graph if you're a social scientist that clearly shows that um, younger people feel incredibly positive about the removal of the statue. Older people in the city um, feel much more negative about the statue um, coming down. Reading through the comments, um, what I think you saw was really a sense of either pride or shame that the, the removal of the statue was either the best day in Bristol's history or the worst day in Bristol's history. And one thing that we're really conscious of is uh, the, the need for intergenerational dialogue within the city, that I think um, this suggests that one of our great divisions within Bristol is between generations. It's not primarily between ethnic groups or social classes, it's primarily between an inter, um, generations. And that's one thing that we're really thinking about how we develop that as a city. How can we create spaces for intergenerational dialogue about the past, about the present, and about the future? Reading the comments, it's clear that many who felt negatively about the statue primarily felt negatively because of the way it was removed. Now, younger people were much more open to direct action, so they felt that direct action was necessary because the city council had dragged its feet for so long over this statue that therefore it was justified to remove it violently. But for many people, and I think especially older people, they were pleased to see the statue gone, but they didn't like the way it was done. They didn't like the fact that it was pulled down violently. And I think my final reflection is really that one of the things that I felt like we need in the UK, and maybe this is also true here, is democratic processes that enable public space to be renegotiated in peaceful ways and consensual ways. There really aren't those kinds of processes in the UK to have these kinds of conversations. In a sense, it was only because the statue was toppled that we actually had the conversation. It would have been better to have the conversation before 
we took the statue down. Um, that would have been a better way to do it. In a sense, the, 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 the statue being toppled forced the conversation. It forced the conversation upon the city. But it happened in some ways too late. And a lot of people wrote this in their responses. A lot of people said, I'm really glad we're talking about this, but I wish we'd talked about it a few years ago. That in some ways this is coming too late. Why hadn't we as a city had this conversation about whether a slave trader is an appropriate figure to have in the center of our city? Um, in some ways, we had that conversation too late. But I think the conversation itself was a really positive experience for the city. Um, it felt like it was an opportunity for people to have their say, but also for people to listen as well, to like listen to the voices of others. Um, and to do that um, in a way that felt respectful, um, but also um, in a way um, that, that I think people felt that they were able to express not just what they think about statues, but also what they feel about statues. Thank you. So, die zweite, die zweite Runde, Fragen und Antworten. Es war jetzt ein, ein Überblick, wie dieser Prozess gestartet hat. Ich würde mich freuen, wenn es noch Fragen, Antworten, ah, sehr gut, und, oder äh, Statements dazu gibt. Wie gesagt, es ist möglich, alles auf Deutsch zu stellen. Äh, Tim Kohl hat eine Übersetzung im Ohr. Und ähm, bitte den Namen, oder wenn man das nicht will, einen Scheinnamen vorzutragen. Damit, die, damit das dokumentiert werden kann. Herzlichen Dank. Und wir haben noch ein Mikrofon, deshalb muss ich vorher schon sagen, ähm, vielleicht tut es nicht zu lange reden, damit es keine Parallelreferate werden. Warte, hinter dir ist noch mehr, dann kommst du. Entschuldige. Hi, uh, my name is Martina. Thank you so much for this. Um, I wondered if you could give an estimation of the importance of time passing between the toppling of the statue and the exhibition you created. And if you, maybe from a subjective point of view, would say that the public discourse, public opinion or media right after the toppling of the statue, that uh, it differentiated from the outcome of your survey, and if so, how? <laughs> maybe you, I overheard, but did you communicate in advance before you took the statue down to the public? Or, and if yes, what did you communicate? Yeah, so um, it's a really interesting question about the immediate response and then the later response. So in some ways we wanted to have a little bit of time after the toppling of the statue to ask these questions. So rather than to do something straight away, to just let a bit of time pass um, and then ask them. Um, what struck me was that the local newspaper um, ran a very quick survey um, and our findings a year later were almost identical. Um, we didn't expect that we, because it, it, in a sense our survey was a much bigger survey, it was much more um, statistically reliable. It, 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 it was much more demographically reliable rather than just a, a quick fire um, survey from the newspaper. Um, but the results were almost identical that immediately after people felt like a museum is the right place for this statue and a year later people said the same, um, the, the majority of people. I think the thing that we did more was to ask about the emotions and feelings. Um, And that's where I think the really interesting data emerged around generations, you know, around the differences between older and younger people. And in particular, I think around the necessity, the value of democratic processes, you know, which is, I think, the thing that we lack, totally lack in, in the UK. Thank you. Da gibt's noch eine Frage. Yeah, I have a more practical question. Um, what's the time horizon for this project? And um, how is it funded? How much funding do you get? Um, and do you have any future plans for your commission, for example? Yeah, it's a great question about um, pragmatics. Um, so the commission, um, we're all volunteers on the commission, so I chair it, and it's made up of um, academic historians from the two universities in the city who um, volunteer their time 
um, and then also a number of other historians in the city, so um, we're not paid. Um, what we did was we worked with the museum service to create the temporary display, and so that came out of museum budget. So we felt it was important to have some kind of temporary display. Um, so that cost, I think it's about 20,000 pounds. We did a temporary display of about 20,000 pounds within the museum, so there was something like that. I can't remember the full um, sum for that. Um, and then we did, um, the, the, there was um, expenditure on the survey. So we did it mainly a digital um, survey, which was relatively cheap to implement. Then we um, used um, some um, funding from the council to do the paper surveys around certain parts of the city and also to have um, a team that would go to do focus groups. Um, so there was money spent on this, but a relatively small sum of money um, considering, I think, the, the level of engagement, um, you know, from across the city. And we used existing bodies within the council, so the museum service um, and the existing body within the council that does consultations, you know, normally about the budget. So it normally does consultations on about the budget or about community um, partnerships. Um, the commission has always been intended to be more than Colston. So it's much more um, about asking a series of questions. Um, who do we remember? Um, uh, to what have we made as a city, so the economic life of the city, how have we lived, the social life of the city, what have we believed, um, politics and faith within the city, what have we fought for, campaigning in the city, what have we fought over, um, dissension in the city, so division within the city, um, to then come back to ask, well, who will we, we remember now? And so that's the piece of work we're doing now, is to do a larger public history project um, with the city, mainly working with the museum service. Um, so I think one of the real strengths of this has been a partnership between academic historians and the city's museums, um, academic historians and the city. That's where I think the value has been, is that partnership building. Ein, eine Frage, die sich für mich gestellt hat, ist, wenn man dieses Denkmal, das ja immer wieder in der Auseinandersetzung war, also es war ja jetzt sozusagen nur, dieses Denkmal war nie rühmlich, außer 1895, wie es aufgestellt worden ist. Aber ich denke immer, wenn man solche Säulen dann stehen lässt, also den Untergrund von diesem Denkmal, wie weit wird es dann auch zu einem Ort, wo Befürworter dieses Denkmals sozusagen sich gerne treffen wollen? Ich bringe das immer an dem Beispiel. In Wien gibt es ein Grab eines berühmten Wehrmachtsfliegers Novotny. Der hatte ein Ehrengrab. Dieses Ehrengrab in dem Friedhof wurde ihm entzogen. Aber trotzdem ziehen die Leute noch immer dorthin und sagen, das Ehrengrab oder das Hitlerhaus in Braunau. Also es gibt immer wieder solche Beispiele. Wie weit kann ich das dann auch anders behandeln und wie kann ich damit umgehen? Weil ich finde das großartig, die Aktion, aber sozusagen, wie gehe ich danach um? Soll man das jetzt anschließen? Do you want to answer immediately or do you want to have another? Ja, okay. Uh, you wait. Sorry, you wait. Sorry, Katharina. Hello, oh, I'm Katharina Struber and um, do you hear me? Uh, yeah, I was in, uh, involved in a competition in Düsseldorf uh, where they um, as well had a um, Beteiligungsprozess um, uh, afterwards because there was big uh, protests. Bitte? Yeah, um, okay. But now it's a... Okay. Um, so, um, the, in the Düsseldorf, uh, the, it was the recontextualization, also the recontextualisierung von einem um, Denkmal, uh, das die Nationalsozialisten aufgestellt haben. Und da gab es einen Wettbewerb und danach, der war dann, da gab es einen sehr starken Protest. Und uh, nach diesem um, Protest gab es dann uh, einen Bürgerbeteiligungsprozess, um, der... Um, die fünf Siegerprojekte, die in diesen äh, noch einmal dargestellt hat mit virtueller äh, Reality, also so äh, Kamerafahrten. Und äh, der Bürgerbeteiligungsprozess war eine Befragung online, äh, der einen Monat lang gedauert hat. Und dann gab es zwei Veranstaltungen und das war es dann. Und äh, ich äh, finde so einen äh, Bürgerbeteiligungsprozess äh, äh, sehr wichtig. Aber wie äh, vermeidet man das? Also, das und der Prozess 
ähm, der da in Düsseldorf stattgefunden hat, hat 110.000 Euro gekostet. Und, äh, so, ähm, ich also, äh, ich finde solche Prozesse total gut, aber ich sehe auch die Gefahr, dass da ähm, sozusagen ein Bürgerbeteiligungsprozess vorgeschoben wird. Wie vermeidet man das? Alibi Prozess. Äh, ich glaube, es wäre gut, antwortet jetzt auf die zwei und die nächsten zwei Fragen. Machen wir Na dann, bitte schön. Was mich interessieren würde, nachdem die Einwohner von Bristol befragt wurden, wie war die Reaktion noch später? Wie haben sich die Bewohner selbst wahrgenommen, dass sie in das involviert wurden? War das gut für das soziale Gefüge in Bristol? Hat man da eine nachhaltige Wirkung noch gespürt? Wollen Sie Ihre Frage auch gleich stellen? Okay. Great, maybe I'll take them in reverse order. Um, I think um, I think there was a, a sense of a, a sense of social cohesion by the fact that people were invited to participate in this conversation. So I think it, people felt that they'd never been asked. So no, no one had ever asked them what they thought about this monument and that people had opinions. So it wasn't like It wasn't that no one in the city had any opinions at all about the Colston statue. Lots of people in the city had opinions, but no one had ever been invited to share those opinions in a public forum. And I think the act of actually inviting people to talk about it was a really positive thing for the city because people were talking about it, but they were talking about it just with their friends, you know, or like with, with their neighbors. But here was a chance publicly to have this conversation and to also, hear the voices of others. So in the museum to see the results coming in or in the report we created, the short report, to actually see the voices. And, and so that was a really positive thing. I, I, I think it took a set of conversations that we should have had a long time ago and made them visible and invited people to contribute to them. And I think that was a really positive thing for social cohesion within the city. I think it was also um, a case that I think people in the city didn't necessarily know what others thought um, because you probably knew what your friends thought, but your friends were probably people like you. You didn't necessarily know what someone else thought. Um, one thing that was interesting reading all of the comments was that um, I said 12% wanted the statue back on the plinth. A lot of those people would write things like, um, at the end of this consultation, you'll know that's how the majority of the city think. Um, and so I think there was a lot of people who felt very strongly that they were part of a majority opinion. Um, they had a strong sense that they were the majority. And I think one of the things that was really interesting about this exercise was that people could see, oh, other people in the city feel or think the same as I do, or other people in the city feel or think differently. Um, and then maybe could try and understand w why people thought the way they did. So I think, there w I think there was a sense in which in, there's a danger to that because you raise division in the city. So you actually, in a sense, the divisions become visible. So in some ways we made the, the divisions, like if you think about age, we made the di divisions vi visible in the city, we exposed those. But I actually think the, the public conversation was really important for social cohesion within the city. You know, I think it was really important. I think the crucial point, second question, was is about actually doing something. Because I think people, consultations, people get tired of consultation if there's no action. And so I think this, what we tried to do with this consultation was to frame it around things that could be done. So do you want the statue in a museum, yes or no? Like we can actually deliver on that. It can be in a museum. How do you want it displayed? If you want it displayed, we can deliver on that. Um, do you want a plaque? Okay, we can deliver a plaque. So I think we tried to work with a lot of things that were about um, deliverables. I think the harder deliverable is the emotional state. And that I think is the harder work around developing intergenerational dialogue in the city. So that's the thing that's you know going to be a longer um, priority, I think, for the city to think about how we create those kinds of spaces where there's relatively few of those within civic society. 
it feels like those are the spaces that are, are missing, that it's unusual for someone who's in their 70s to talk to someone in their 20s apart from their grandchildren. Like it, it maybe in a faith community in the city, you have a little bit of that exchange, but actually outside of faith communities or associations or neighbors, rel relatively little. And so I think that's a longer term thing for us as a city to work on. We, it's, it's interesting, we had thought about whether we say remove the whole plinth. Some people wanted that, so there's a few people that say that, but most people actually wanted the plinth to stay to make the absence more present. So they, they said things like, if we take the plinth away, then people will forget the statue was here. And we actually want people to know that the statue was here, and then it's now being taken down. And we, like it was pulled down, like they wanted the pulling down of the statue to be made really visible. Um, and people wanted that like absent presence, present absence, like they talked in those terms, that they wanted the, the absence to be really visible. And they also wanted, they didn't want the city to forget that in 1895 the city put a statue up to a man who was centrally involved in the slave trade. And then in 2020, people in the city took the statue down. But the fact that the statue was put up, they felt was really important. So they didn't want the statue still there because it felt like that was honoring a man who was centrally involved in the slave trade um, and that it needed more contextualization than a single plaque. But they, they wanted the plinth left because then in a sense it hinted at the statue. Like it hinted at the fact that this man, and maybe then also people would ask the question, well, why did you leave it there till 2020? Like, why did it take you so long to get rid of this statue? And so in a sense, there was a, a sense that came through in people's responses that they really felt like the plinth was important. Um, it, it would, because an empty plinth says something and says something quite powerful in the city. And so they, they wanted the plinth to stay. So, wir haben jetzt noch drei Fragen. Der Herr hinten hat schon lange gewartet und dann kommt ihr alle. Friedemann Dersch mit Akademie der Bildenden Künste. Ich beschäftige mich mit transgenerationeller Weitergabe von Ideologie in meinen Projekten, also auch in Familien, aber auch in gesellschaftlichen Gruppen. Meine Frage in Bezug auf die Demokratisierung solcher Diskussionsprozesse ist, in Österreich kann ich das ganz gut zeigen, dass also sehr, sehr viele sozusagen ideologische Restbestände bei Leuten vorhanden sind, die nicht einmal wissen, dass sie die haben. Beispiel sind zum Beispiel, ich habe jetzt eine Facebook-Diskussion gehabt über ein angebliches heidnisches Kultdenkmal, also eine Kultstätte, die dort stand, wo der Stephansdom steht. Dort war historisch war dort nichts. Das geht zurück auf eine von den Nazis für viel Geld initiierte Forschungsarbeit von Hitler, Himmlers Ahnenerbe am Drosenberg, wo diese Alternative Facts, diese News sozusagen in die Bevölkerung implantiert wurden. Das war ganz aktive Propaganda, die bis heute da ist. Jetzt habe ich das Problem, wenn ich so einen Prozess einfach nur demokratisch zurückspiele, bekomme ich im Prinzip eine, eine, Art, eine Art Abdruck äh, dieser, dieser Propaganda, dieser Alternative Fake News, die ja mit Absicht gemacht wurden, also die waren ja nicht blöd, die Nazis, die haben auch was gewollt und sie waren sehr erfolgreich, weil das Zeug bis heute in den Köpfen spuckt. Und wenn ich die Leute jetzt mit solchen Fragen konfrontiere, dann kriege ich es hauptsächlich zu tun mit einem Haufen sehr unreflektierten äh, Informationszeug. Und jetzt ist die Frage, also kann ich das jetzt nur festmachen sozusagen an den physischen Denkmälern, an diesen Objekten oder müsste dieser Prozess nicht in irgendeiner Weise anders und vor allem auch hierarchisiert, also wer bringt das Knowledge ein, also wer, wer analysiert das, wer macht die Wissenschaftskritik und so weiter. Ich glaube, er soll jetzt gleich antworten, oder? Weil sonst wird es zu... Yeah, I think that's a really important question. Um, and it's one reason why we decided not just to do a consultation and survey, but to have a museum exhibition. Because we could then use the display to talk about all of those questions, so to really contextualize a statue. And so we wanted people to respond after they'd learned something about the statue. So to learn about when the statue was put up, um, and who put it up and to learn about Colston and what his role was, to learn about all of the protests that have happened over the last 
few um, um, decades to learn more about the Black Lives Matters movement, to hear different voices. So we really wanted to have almost quite a pedagogic um, context in which we then pose the question. So rather than just saying, what do you think about the statue? We wanted people to explore the statue and try and understand it and think about it and reflect on it and then to respond. Um, and what was interesting was that, so I read all of the comments from everyone um, and it was, it was clear that people had really done that because they'd write things like, oh, I never knew about this part of, or aspect, or seeing it in this way, it's made me think this. And so I think that is part of the, the importance with these kinds of consultations, is that in a sense you equip people to respond in the round so that they're able to learn um, about all sorts of things um, and then to make a decision and contribute their position based on that learning. And one thing we wanted to do was we um, wanted to make sure that that was as objective as it could be. So we didn't want to have a leading set of questions. We tried to offer as much historical context without commentary. Um, and over the statue, we had a shifting dialogue between the two voices in the city. So those that wanted it to be destroyed and those who wanted it back on the plinth. So we would almost offer um, a sense of a dialogue so you would see the opposing voice and you would then be thinking a bit about how you position yourself. So we tried, as far as possible, to give people a really rich contextualization of the object within the museum, and then to invite people to respond. And so I think when you read the responses, you see that that work paid off, that the responses were really thoughtful and really reflective. Um, and I think, to me, that's critical. It's not just saying, almost like vox pox, like, what do you think? But actually, let's have a, a bit more of an in-depth, reflective conversation. Let's find out about this statue and explore it together, and then let's talk about it. So that felt really important that we put that time into that. Music